Jen Kiaba, thanks so much for coming on to talk police from your home in New York. You are a photo-based artist as well as an educator and were born into the Unification Church, a sect whose members are often referred to as the Moonies. We'll be looking at some of your artistic works as we go along, and we'll see that they reflect a lot of the pain and confusion that you went through during those tumultuous years. So uh, have you been doing, Jen? Have the various lockdowns inspired your art in any way, or has it just been business as usual? First of all, thank you for having me. I'm, I'm thrilled to be talking to you. The lockdown specifically hasn't been inspiring any work yet in the photo-based world. I've really been focusing on shifting my attention to writing, which I think will mm. eventually manifest itself in new photo work. But I think that around lockdown was probably the last time that I created any new work. And so I've been focusing my creative energies elsewhere for a little while. I find that that's a, a really healthy way to reset, especially in super stressful mm. times like what we're in. The Unification Church may not be familiar to all our viewers. So, Jen, could you give a brief overview of the Unification Church, how it sure. began, its major figures, and what their main beliefs are? So I can share with you the mythology of the Unification Church that I was brought up with. However, um, mm -hmm. maybe in some of the show notes, I can also share for you uh, resources from scholars that have actually delved into the fact-based uh. history of the Unification Church. But from my understanding, it started in the 1950s in Korea, what is now North Korea. And uh, Reverend Sun Myung Moon supposedly was praying on a mountaintop on Easter morning and he was visited by the spirit of Jesus, who asked him to complete Jesus's mission. According to Reverend Moon, the dying on the cross was not actually a fulfillment of Jesus's mission. That was more of a spiritual salvation for humanity, but not a physical salvation. And the true mission of Jesus was to get married, have children, and have this ideal family. Because in church theology, in the Garden of Eden, uh, they believe that Lucifer had a sexual relationship with Eve, which was the fall, and then Eve sort of perpetrated that fall onto Adam. And so what that did was create this uh, lineage based on Lucifer slash Satan, as opposed to this lineage based on God. So mm -hmm. the Unification Church is sort of very... Um, lineage and blood lineage based. So this idea of Jesus completing his mission was, again, that it would have restored the blood lineage of humanity away from Satan to God. And so from there, Moon started preaching in Korea. Mm -hmm. And in church mythology, his preaching was so radical that uh, he was imprisoned multiple times. And the church really interprets this as like, the persecution. Uh, persecution satanic forces rallying mm. against moon because he was trying to complete god's mission um but what i learned later was that some of the practices of the unification church were uh against the morality of many of the korean people and certainly even in the united mm. states we would consider some of this to be a little radical moon prior to establishing the unification church supposedly practiced something uh called pigadoon and i'm probably butchering the korean of that but it translates to womb cleansing and we would look at it as like uh group sex generally sometimes orgies but at the end of the day, Moon had to have sex with all of his female followers in order to cleanse the womb. Um, and that was sort of the way that, that you were converted into the church. Now, that history was somewhat buried when he came to the United States because I guess he realized that that wasn't going to fly in, in terms of American morality. It certainly didn't in Korean morality. And so uh, the Unification Church became a lot more based in what we would now recognize as like purity culture. And so they started recruiting, I think as early as the 60s, but it really wasn't until the 1970s that the Unification Church came onto the map. Um, and so many people 
know them from like the fundraising that they had done in airports and whatnot. Um, and they, they really came to the attention of the media in the mid 70s when parents started hiring deprogrammers to literally capture their children, like kidnap them and uh, mm. take them away from the church. So that's that's I think that and then the mass weddings uh, is what people might remember the church for. The I think the, the biggest mass wedding um, or the earliest mass wedding that's in popular imagination is the 1982 Madison Square Garden wedding, which oh, is yes. where my parents were married. Um, and that's that that sort of goes back to again this idea of um, restoring the lineage. So Moon uh, chose the partners for all of his followers. So my parents didn't know each other before they were matched by Moon and then married in this mass wedding. And I grew up assuming that Moon would choose my partner as well. And the idea is is that when you receive the blessing from Moon and then you perform um, certain rites that are probably based in the group sex, <laughs> um, you are restored away from Satan's lineage. As someone who was born into the church, I didn't have to perform those rites, but my parents did. So... We can get into that later if you like. Okay. It reminds me in places of the Mormon religion. Uh, you yes. know, Joseph Smith went into the mm -hmm. forest and Jesus appeared to him and said, uh, we need to restore the gospel. It was all, right. it's, it's all been wrong. And uh, then he went off and had uh, allegedly sex with all the women yes. in the town. Yep. Uh, of course, that was in the mid 1800s. It sounds uh, a bit familiar. Yeah. Yeah. And I mean, you know, one could argue that, um, sex as a religious practice is not uncommon when you look at human history. It's just that uh, I think that the way that the Unification Church and other groups use sex and control sex is problematic. And then mm. when you realize that the group was based in sexual ritual that was then uh, completely frowned upon and covered up, it, it becomes very complicated and uncomfortable. Well, you were born into the Unification Church, part of its so-called second generation, and grew up surrounded by fellow church members. Then you moved and were a bit more isolated, but that's when your parents uh, tightened up on the rules, isn't that right? Yeah, we moved away from the Washington, D.C. area after kindergarten for me, and we moved about two hours away from the closest church members. And so I was in the public school system and away from other second generation, we called them blessed children. And I think that my mother was very afraid of the influence that what we called the outside world or the fallen world would have on me. And so she was uh, very vigilant about breaking down my relationships with people outside of the family unit. So friends were frowned upon, um, any kind of close relationships that I had with teachers were also severed. And, and what happened was that um, my family became kind of hardcore in terms of the practices of the church. Mm -hmm. So we had morning service every day. Not every family in the church did this, but we would wake up before six o'clock and go into our prayer room and uh, bow and pray to the altar, which had a photograph of uh, Reverend and Mrs. Moon on it. Um, and, you know, we would read the words of Moon and if both of my parents were unavailable to lead these services, like my sister and I at eight and six respectively would be reading or, or, or uh, running it. And, you know, it's funny because in my conversations with people later, um, I realized that that was definitely not the norm. Like some kids definitely got to integrate more into like their public school environment or they mm -hmm. didn't do these daily morning services. They certainly never ran them as children. And so I think what happened was that uh, my parents purposefully created this closed environment uh, to, in their minds, I think, to protect us. Um, mm. But what it did is, is it created a high control kind of family unit within a high control religion. Well, growing up Mooney was anything but fun and games for you. In fact, there was a lot of hard labor expected of its mm. members, even uh, even for young children, isn't that right? Yeah, um, when I was 12, we moved to Arizona where uh, I was slightly more integrated into a church community. It was small. And although my mother had sent me to workshops as young as eight where I got to see um, 
kind of how intense these environments were in terms of, I mean, basically indoctrinating us. You know, we would have like lectures all day with short breaks and things, and there was uh, labor and forced exercise and things kind of used as a, a tool. Um, it never really struck me as this was a part of church culture until, again, we moved and I integrated into a larger community. Um, we really had to earn our fun, free time. And that might sound super normal, but the ways in which we earned that time was, for example, um, the, the church leader at the time was also a part of the Arizona state government because Reverend Moon had this initiative that Unification Church members should infiltrate the government so that we could eventually control it. And at 12 years old, he, um, when I was 12, he had me and my younger sister, who was then 10, go out and canvas the, the district with his two young children. Um, he basically dropped us off in various neighborhoods. We'd be knocking on doors, handing out pamphlets and getting signatures mm -hmm. and asking to put up signs for hours on end. Um, again, in Arizona, summer heat, too. Oh, yeah. Um, <clears throat> and that was my first introduction, I think, like, the first week that I was there. And I remember questioning this, being like, hey, I have a pool, you know, near my house. Why aren't we at the pool? <laughs> and um, being severely criticized for this kind of thinking and behavior. And uh, this continued um, shortly thereafter on the uh, July 4th uh, holiday, we were sent out into a city park to fundraise with like light ropes. Um, and so, you know, again, you have uh, in, in this case, it was me, my younger sister, and then another girl who was about 12 years old, wandering around unsupervised, selling product and carrying a lot of money. Um, mm. and, and another time I remember, like we were sent to the leader's house to literally clean his, his kitchen tile floor with toothbrushes. And again, like when I stood up and was like, why are we doing this? Like, this isn't fun. Um, I was criticized not only by my peers, but also by the leader as well and told, you know, I have to stop caning out. This was a phrase that we used to shame people. So caning out refers to the biblical brother Cain who killed his mm -hmm. brother Abel. Um, and the, the intent with that is to say, like, when you're being negative, you're inviting evil spirit world and you could literally like commit murder if you are. Uh, going down that path and so it's really like a sit down and shut up thing it sounds like labor trafficking you're talking about right and so you know that's not a phrase that i learned until very recently but it's something that um the church i think was definitely grooming us towards because when i was 17 there was this sort of mission period that we were supposed to go on and that was absolutely labor trafficking um but you know the, the thing is is that when I look back at my parents and their generation, this is what they did. Like as soon as they kind of went through their conversion experience, leaders packed them up into vans. They put them on this program called Mobile Fundraising Team, and they were labor trafficked all across the country. And so I think that what happened was that uh, my parents' generation thought that this is how they raised good little moonies is perpetuate that same kind of training on them. And so some kids didn't experience that at quite such a young age. Um, they didn't experience it perhaps, and again, until they went on, on these missions. But for me, it did start quite early. Well, you eventually entered high school and enjoyed some freedom of expression at last. But being in that environment also led you to experience your first doubts. So uh, tell us about those years. So, I mean, I think that my doubts probably started very, very early. A, a seed may have been even as early as eight, just because um, when I experienced some of these workshops, it was mm -hmm. my first encounter with first generation. And they were those the teachers that I had in public schools were a very strong counterpoint. And at a young age, I couldn't have articulated it to you, but I, I definitely felt that first generation were not trustworthy adults. And, and every experience sort of built on that. But by the time I got to high school, my mother was actually the state leader of Arizona. Um, she had stepped up t into this vacancy. And, and I think the only reason that they let a woman take the position is because nobody wanted it. <laughs> it was, um, <laughs> It was a position that attracted a lot of ire. 
and my mother courted it too. So uh, there was that, but it kept her out of the house a lot. And what that did was that it let me form relationships with kids in my neighborhood and kids at school. And uh, I started experiencing romantic attachment to a young man in my school. And we started dating secretly. You know, I never told anybody about my identity. Uh, that was, it was my secret identity, according to my mother. Mm. Um, because, you know, when I was five years old or something, I had a friend in the neighborhood and I said something to her like, Susie, I'm better than you because I'm a blessed child and you're not. And when my mom found out, she was like, oh my God, you can't tell people this. And so from then on, you know, I had to keep this status uh, secret. And so I never revealed to my boyfriend or my friends like, hey, I'm growing up in this weird environment. This is why I'm not allowed to date. They just understood that at 14, you know, some parents might have some questions mm -hmm. about their children dating. And so for them, it was like this delicious secret that they helped keep. Um, <laughs> but what that did for me was it helped me to understand that um, my status was at risk too, because there was another girl in the Arizona community who had strayed and the, the community had basically shunned her. Um, and I had seen her a couple of times at church and I was terrified of that same thing happening to me. And now in the Unification Church, there's no formal process for shunning. It's not like in Jehovah's Witnesses where there's a disfellow disfellowship process. Mm -hmm. um, it was just basically like people would just remove themselves from you. They wouldn't interact with you. And so on one hand, I'm questioning the whole theological basis of my existence. You know, like this boyfriend doesn't feel wrong, but that's how Satan gets you. You know, he, he gives you what you think you want, right, to tempt you. That's what I had been taught. And I was certainly afraid of being rejected by my church community, but at the same time, I was also seeing things that just made me so uncomfortable. And again, you know, this sense of like the adults not being trustworthy was, was very loud at that point in my life. Well, you later became close to a young man at church. It was around this time that you found yourself at church boarding school, a dark right. time where you experienced a lot of bullying. You had this new boyfriend at church, but of course it wasn't up to you who you ended up with. Isn't that right? Right. Yeah. Um, and at the time I would have never used the word boyfriend um, because <laughs> A, like you weren't allowed to have any kind of emotional attachment to anybody. That was a stain on your purity. If anybody found out in church, it would have uh, definitely caused me to have been ousted. But yeah, I, I developed a very close emotional relationship with a young man around the time that I was 15. Um, my family was going through a lot of upheaval and my parents actually separated for about a year and a half. And so my mother took us to this uh, boarding school in New Eden. She got a job as the dorm mother. And I kind of kept my relationship with this young man secret. And the fact that my parents were separated meant that, again, my status in the church was um, being questioned. This was just one more layer of secret that I had to keep because if, mm. if anybody found out that my parents were separated um, for, you know, abuse and things like that that were going on, um, I would have been considered a an unworthy, unwantable candidate for this blessing ceremony. So the and way blessing that means my... marriage, doesn't it? Correct. Just to, yes. To clarify, yeah. in the Unification Church. Right. And um, so the way that my parents sort of hid their separation was that they told people that their missions had taken them in different places. And that was very common, actually. Um, you know, Moon <laughs> worked in amazing ways to break down the nuclear family structure. So it was very common for maybe a father to have a mission in a completely different country um, or parents to leave their children behind for years on end. We even had these church nurseries that were tantamount mm -hmm. to orphanages where parents left their children for years to work on missions. So this was a secret that I was keeping. My parents weren't separated by mission. They were separated because the marriage itself was falling apart. And so the only person that I shared with was this young man. And, um, and it, what that did was it created this new level of question for me 
Um, A, because I was realizing that that my candidacy in mm. for marriage was tenuous at best. And the idea of keeping who I was a secret now from my community was uh, unpalatable. And the fact that this young man accepted me for who I was and didn't judge me based on my family was very refreshing. But problematically, like you were saying, we weren't allowed to even have emotional relationships with each other, much less choose who we were going to be with. And then while I was at this church boarding school, Moon announced that the parents were going to be doing the matchings. He was not going to match the second generation anymore. And this was, on one hand, I looked at it as like, I might be able to maneuver some influence in this Mm. situation now. Um, However, if I cannot, because we were not supposed to, it was supposed to be completely up to the parents. If I was not able to, Uh, my candidacy was even more tenuous because if I had been matched to somebody via Reverend Moon, people would have looked at it as like, this is God's choice for you, you know? And so it would have been harder for somebody to reject me. But if it was just a parent's matching and it came out about my family's background, well, Mm -hmm. then people would be like, well, screw this. We don't want you. We don't want to have, you know, associations with this sort of family. Because once parents were matching, it did become sort of a, a social and political maneuvering tool. Well, sadly, things didn't work out with your boyfriend and you ended Mm -hmm. up on what was called the seven year course. So uh, what was that all about? So the seven year course was this name for, uh, I guess this, sort of training program for the second generation when leaders realized that second generation were didn't have the same kinds of conversion experiences that their parents did they wanted to create something that helped them like deepen their spiritual relationship with moon um, or with god and to help kind of facilitate a, a conversion experience and so the seven-year course, and it was used uh, interchangeably with the formula course, was um, this training that consisted of a year of living in a van and fundraising like our parents did, and then a year of witnessing. So living in something called a center, which was a church-owned property and like a communal property where you would live in you know, a room with 20 other brothers or sisters, as we referred to them as sometimes even having like communal clothing and things like that. Um, And after that, we were supposed to spend four years at the University of Bridgeport because the Unification Church had invested enough there to have a controlling stake in the board. So the idea was that we would work with the uh, collegiate front group of the church to, again, do more witnessing activities. And then after that, we were supposed to go on a foreign mission. So originally... Um, I graduated high school at 16 and I felt that I was too young to go on the formula course. Mm. I wanted a little bit of time. Um, and then eventually I, I was still trying to convince my parents who had been forced back together by the church at this point, I was trying to convince them to, uh, think about accepting me and this young man that was my boyfriend for a match. So I decided in the logic of the church that I had grown up with to basically sacrifice myself for a year and try this first year of the formula course, which we called Special Task Force. And it was Mm -hmm. named this to have that association with these like tactical military groups. Um, And again, this was the labor trafficking that I was referring to uh, before. We literally slept in the vans and fundraised seven days a week bringing in hundreds of dollars per person all of that went up to the church here here's my cat that i told you about she has come to to join the interview um and i lasted about three months on this program before i got too sick to continue you know people died doing this and this was a a very dark point in my faith because Anytime people struggled up until the point where a young woman was murdered uh, doing STF, as, as we referred to it for short, it, it really helped me to understand that life wasn't very sacred in the church. 
But again, you know, I was 17 and I didn't have the intellectual or financial or emotional resources to separate myself uh, from this, this group. But it was definitely uh, one of the lower points in my faith. After all you'd been through, you gave in to your parents' wishes and were married within the church. So what was that like for you to have to go through that? Um, It was the most terrifying experience I've ever gone through. So this this happened um, right after I turned 20. I had been working for the church um, in an environment that was somewhat similar to the the STF environment that I described where, you know, I was sleep deprived, sleeping on a floor, working intense mm. hours, um, you know, nutritionally deprived. So I, uh, I look back on my past self with a lot of compassion uh, as somebody who is completely primed to be controlled. But I uh, came home for the Christmas holidays, which sort of coincides with the Uh, highest holy day in the Unification Church we call January 1st God's Day. And so Mm -hmm. I came home to celebrate this with my parents. And I had, so I was making a hundred dollars a month. That was my salary (laughs) or my stipend. And so I basically used that money to buy a train train ticket home. And uh, I was, I was working for one of the central uh, organizations, the second generation department of the Unification Church down in New York City. And it must have been like on my train ride home, there was news that uh, Moon was going to do a matching for the second generation. So five years have maybe, yeah, maybe five years had elapsed since he had stepped down. And when you and, say matching, uh, you mean literally putting a boy and girl together. Yes, yeah. To get to get um, married or blessed, mm-hmm. as they call it. Correct, yeah. Um, so, you know, it, the, the reason that I, I mentioned that this must have been on my train ride home was because, uh, because I was working for one of these central organizations. Had the announcement come down while I was still in the office, I would have heard about it, but hmm. I did not hear about it until I got home a few hours later, and my mother picked me up, brought me home, sat me down in uh, her bedroom, And she and my dad basically said, like, here's the situation. Moon is doing a matching. Well, they called him True Father. That's what we called him. Mm. I call him Moon now. (laughs) Um, (laughs) And, you know, he was in his 80s at this point. And he may have had some uh, health issues as well. Um, But from my mother's standpoint, you know, she didn't know if he would ever do a matching again. It was the first one in almost half a decade. And my parents had tried matching me before, and it did not work out because I rebelled. <laughs> and so um, there was, again, like this other layer of stain on my purity and my eligibility. And so uh, there were many reasons why my mom looked at this as incredibly important for me to attend. And I think because the announcement was so new, we thought it was just going to be this matching, right? Not a blessing marriage ceremony, which I did find out later was not the case. Um, but when she sat me down, she said to me, you know, A, this is important. If, if I didn't uh, succeed in getting matched, it was going to be that much harder for my four younger siblings to find partners in the church. Um, we didn't know if Moon was going to do this again. And she said, Jenny, if Jesus came to you and said he had found your perfect spouse, what would you say to him? Now, how much more is true father? Because in the church, we Mm. believed that moon was greater than Jesus, right? So basically, you know, it was this moment of like, you either confront your faith completely, or, you know, you you go along with this. Um, And I had no Mm. support network outside of the church. And I figured, okay, well, I've already gotten out of one matching. So if this doesn't work out, that's going to be okay. So my mom drove me the next day to uh, Moon's East Garden Mansion compound down in Irvington, New York. And so imagine you're driving through like iron gates and security. And I think it's like 18 acres of, Mm. of property down there. And I was ushered into the ballroom of this conference center that Moon had built on the property. And it was, it was basically like, second generation from all over the world flew in for this event. And when I got there, I was like, 
people have wedding dresses. What's going mm. on? You know, and uh, as soon as I realized that uh, um, not only was this a matching ceremony, but this was a blessing ceremony, I lost it. And I started asking people to borrow their cell phones because this was 2004. So it was like the introduction of flip phones in, in this oh, yeah. era. And I didn't have one, couldn't afford it. Um, and so I started calling home, begging my parents to come pick me up. I was like, I, I cannot, I am not ready for this. And not only would my parents not allow me, but then uh, I started going to the leaders at this event and telling them, I'm not ready for this. I don't want to be here. I need to leave. Um, but I didn't have money <laughs> to leave or anything like that. So I was asking for permission and help to get out. And eventually I worked my way up to the top leader at the event. And he sat me down and, and we had this long conversation. And, you know, I told him everything about my family. I was just like, look, not only am I not ready, but like, I cannot be here for all of these emotional reasons. Like there's all of this trauma that I've carried over the years from my family situation. Um, I'm not ready to make this kind of step in my life. And he looked at me and he says, you know what I think? I think you're just chicken shit. And I just, I completely broke down at that point. I was sobbing. I was like, you're right, I am chicken shit. And so uh, a few days later, I was in the same ballroom married to a stranger. Like I had a wedding dress that didn't even fit because we had to buy one on such short notice. So Jeez. it was, yeah, it was a horrible experience. And at the same time, what it did is it really crystallized for me that I did not believe in this. And so from that point on, I spent the next two years fighting to get out of both the marriage and the church. Jen, people might want to ask you why it took two years to uh, to end the marriage. So for clarity, in the Unification Church, um, people had the blessing, which was sort of the religious ceremony, and then they could go either have, um, you know, the the secular paperwork, as it were, to have the legal marriage. Some people had other marriage ceremonies for their families and whatnot. So in my case, there was no legal marriage between myself and this young man who was from another country. Um, but I knew that based on my interactions with my family, with his family, and with him personally, that the only way for me to end this relationship without being harassed was to get the equivalent of a church divorce. Now, we didn't have language for that, but we had paperwork for it, mm. and both parties had to sign it. And so even though I was fighting pre-marriage ceremony, post-marriage ceremony, it did take that long, almost two years. I think it was like a year and 10 months before um, I finally had, A, a leader who was willing to hear my story and even, like, present the paperwork, but also uh, for the other party to sign it as well. And without that, um, I just don't think that anybody else would have considered the marriage to be over. And for me personally, I really needed to have that clean break. Well, you are now out of the church and have found a great deal of pleasure in your creations. Your medium is photo-based art art which is highly expressionistic. You have exhibitions of your works and also give talks where you explore healing through visual art. So Jen, would you encourage anyone who has grown up in a cult or a similar coercive situation to look to the arts as a way of uh, empowering themselves? Absolutely. Um, I mean, I think that using your artistic voice even before you've had a chance to escape is so important. Um, I look back on some of my sketchbooks from when I was 15 and 16, and I see the same kind of art in them that I create now. I think that for me, uh, utilizing the visual arts specifically, but you know, theater as well was a tool for me, but using visual arts was a way for me to express my experience when I didn't have verbal language for it. I think that the body understands things that sometimes we don't intellectually understand. And it took me a lot of research to be able to um, vocalize my experience, to speak about it and to understand what like the underpinnings were, like coercive control and domestic violence. But because these weren't things that we spoke about in my upbringing, 
I didn't understand mm-hmm. them. I didn't really know about them. But um, I knew that colors could represent feeling. I knew that um, various symbolism expressed something to me. And so that was a huge foundation for me to begin exploring my experience as a woman in a very patriarchal society, um, in a society that uh, was highly sexualized, but was also very emotionally and mentally violent around sexuality. And then it was an opportunity for me post group life to start connecting with other survivors and to understand that Mm. um, whether somebody has grown up in a cultic environment or not, there is Mm. a lot of understanding between survivors of various kinds of domestic violence, again, um, high demand, high control environments. And it made me feel less alone. So I absolutely encourage anybody uh, who is going through a healing process or a questioning process to look to the arts as a mode of understanding your experience and uh, connecting to yourself, but also connecting to others. It's been quite a journey for you, Janet, and I'm very glad that you've been able to come onto the show to share your story. I will leave links to your artistic works and social media in the description below. And all that's left to say is thanks once again for coming on to Talk Beliefs. Thank you so much for having me. It has been wonderful talking to you. And I hope that, um, you know, anybody who's watching, if if they feel inspired to explore their experience, they, they feel the permission and the safety to do so.